it all began on the morning of the parade. Max had just returned from his trip to the space station. He was a hero, after all. None of the astronauts could have come home safely without him. As Max's car drove along Pearl Street, Max looked to the west and he began to howl just as the moon set over the mountains. In truth, Max howled because he heard a siren. He always howls at sirens. But the TV reporters didn't know that, so they thought he was howling at the moon. A reporter spotted Max's friend, Tori. Why did Max howl at the moon, he asked. I'm not sure, said Tori. Maybe it's because he wants to go there. Oh, hello there. Welcome to CU Science Update. I'm your host, Rose Heapy, and this is my friend, Ringo. <laughs> We're reading this award-winning children's book by Boulder author, Dr. Jeffrey Bennett. It's called Max Goes to the Moon, and it's beautifully illustrated by Alan Okamoto. It's the story of a girl and her dog who get to go on a brilliant adventure to the moon. The book is a fun read for all adults, children, and dogs. I wasn't gonna forget you, Ringo. <laughs> That's right. It's also scientifically accurate. Max Goes to the Moon is presented by Big Kid Science. In the pages running parallel to the story are sidebars that help explain the science behind the story with topics about spacesuits, lunar phases, gravity, and what would happen if you throw a frisbee on the moon. Easy, Ringo. Playtime later. Max Goes to the Moon has won several awards and was endorsed by the National Science Teachers Association. It was picked by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, as an outstanding educational product. And it's also one of the first children's books to be read in space. As Max's car drove down Pearl Street, Max looked to the west and began to howl just as the moon set over the mountains. In truth, Max howled because he heard a siren. He always howls at sirens, but the TV reporters didn't know that, so they thought he was howling at the moon. Max Goes to the Moon was on the Space Shuttle Discovery's final mission in March 2011. It was read by astronaut Alvin Drew. A former United States Air Force pilot with more than 30 years of flying experience, Colonel Drew became a NASA astronaut in July 2000. He logged more than 600 hours in space on two shuttle missions, and he became the 200th person to walk in space. But it was on Discovery's last mission when astronaut Drew decided that he wanted to do some kind of children's activity in space. So he persuaded his fellow astronauts to read a few good science books for kids. For himself, he chose Max Goes to the Moon. Tori picked up the frisbee and threw it again. This time Max knew what to do. She threw it very high so Max had time to get under it. I like the idea of something with a space theme since we were in space, at least as for starters, and we could branch off from there. And the story just kind of dovetail with what I thought was you know, any kid's fantasy, you know, going to the moon, taking your dog. A book about an adventure in space being read by someone who is also having an adventure in space. How cool is that? Max, Tori, and the astronauts had plenty of work to do for the next few days. They collected moon rocks for science and they set up telescopes to study distant planets and stars. But most of all, they loved gazing upward at the Earth, which seemed to hang in one place in the sky. But what's really cool is that Max Goes to the Moon is being transformed into a planetarium show right here at CU. That's right, Ringo. CU has a planetarium, Fisk Planetarium, and it's been here since 1975. Built from funds donated by Wallace Franz Fisk, a CU alum from the class of 1917, Fisk is a landmark feature on campus with its distinctive aluminum geodesic dome. It's the venue for a diverse number of star shows, laser shows, and live multimedia events. In the early days, star shows were produced using slides and negatives and rows of slide projectors controlled by pre-computer automation systems. At the centerpiece of its 65-foot diameter projection screen is a 1971-era Zeiss Mark VI star projector, affectionately known as Fritz. Only a handful in the world still exist, a product of the old analog that is now being replaced with digital technology. Tori gave Max the good news. You are going to go to the moon, she said. 
With Max Goes to the Moon, the Fisk team is taking their first steps into the next era of planetarium production using digital equipment and software like Final Cut Pro, Adobe Photoshop, and Cinema 4D. Max made the long training session seem fun. With a little parallax, it totally he brought a frisbee. Totally changes to the everything. Moon? And so, yeah, so you can see the bounding is very rudimentary, but but not too shabby. You know, our first attempts were fundamentally based on just the book and just Ken Burnsing across the screen, and then we just did a little bit of tweaking with the parallax, and now we're making full 3D models of Max. <laughs> See Science Update went behind the scenes at Fisk and learned that you just can't take a book and slap it into a planetarium show. You have to write a script, find a voice to narrate. Well, he is a dog, so he couldn't have known he'd go so far and so high. Create sound effects. You know, that sounds like a spacesuit helmet. Yeah. And make the illustrations come alive. In making the planetarium show, we had to take the book and really add a lot of elements and sort of embellish the book so that it could sort of go beyond a, a bedtime story and really come to life on the screen. Education Programs Manager Matthew Benjamin has been writing and producing shows at Fisk since 2004. Max Goes to the Moon has been one of his most challenging. Going away from just the images in the book, there's so much rich story with Max Goes to the Moon and so much science that we needed to bring in NASA footage. We needed to animate our own footage and we needed to bring in images from spacecraft. And so a lot of that stuff really made it very encompassing in, in producing this in a video format rather than it being just a, a book read as a nighttime story. As an educator, Matthew tries to invigorate young minds with a passion for science a drive that also inspired astronaut Alvin Drew to read Max Goes to the Moon over 200 miles above Earth. Matthew saw a unique opportunity. So Matthew invited astronaut Drew to come to Colorado and record an introduction for the show, an invitation he gladly accepted. And we thought this would be a great way to motivate the kids watching Max in the planetarium to see an astronaut to see someone that they would look up to, a hero of theirs, talk about this great book and hopefully add further credence to why the kids would be interested in this story. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Alvin Drew. On my last mission, I got a chance to read the story of Max Goes to the Moon to the Children of Earth. The recording session began in July 2011 at CU's Atlas Production Studio. Colonel Drew recalled what it was like as a four-year-old boy watching planes take off and becoming obsessed with anything that could fly. But in grade school, while suffering through arithmetic, the principal stopped the class and set up a dusty black and white television to pick up the broadcast of Apollo 7's liftoff. Five, four, three, ignition. two, we have ignition. It was 1968, and as the rocket ascended beyond sight, Drew was hooked. The missions that followed would finally put men on the moon with the landing of Apollo 11. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. At that time, Drew turned to his dad with a quandary. Should he become a pilot or should he become an astronaut? His dad told him he could do both. Up to that point, every astronaut had been a pilot, a test pilot. So he says, you can fly airplanes and you can fly rockets. I said, great, that's what I'm going to go do. And he goes, oh, back up a second. There's something about getting good grades and staying out of trouble. And I was like, that, that's all, that's all. Like, we can work those out, those details later. Uh, and then I was off and running after that. And uh, like I said, I was, I'm no longer suffering through arithmetic, I was training to be an astronaut. I'm NASA astronaut Alvin Drew. When I was growing up, I dreamt of becoming an astronaut while watching the Apollo missions to the moon. How many of you dream of becoming astronauts when you grow up? It takes careful preparation to produce a planetarium show, especially one that could make science exciting for children. 
I'd only weigh 20 pounds on the moon. And you could lift six times as much. However, as many young people continue their education, fewer are choosing science and mathematics. Matthew hopes to reverse this trend, at least doing his part to inspire and enthuse children to stay engaged in science. One of the things I, I usually end every talk with, with, when I talk with kids, and even adults for that matter, is I usually ask them a fun little question. I ask, what do black holes do? And 99 out of 100 kids will leap out because they want to they want to share that they know something about a black hole, and they usually say black holes suck stuff in. And I quickly step in and correct them, and I say, you know, you're, you're almost right, but I have to tell you that science never sucks, especially black holes. And science pushes and pulls, but science definitely never sucks. And that's my fun little quip to kind of get them to laugh and also realize that indeed, yeah, science is fun and it just doesn't suck. So black holes pull. And then I follow up and say, so what do vacuums do? And usually a few of them quickly start to say, S -s 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 I mean pull, and uh, they get back on it. And I have to pay respect that I didn't create that. That was my sixth grade science teacher who told that to us on a daily basis. Um, he's since passed away. And so I feel almost honored to be passing on his legacy of science never sucks to every child and, and school group that I interact with. What's that, Ringo? You'll jump over the moon for science too? <laughs> Good boy. Well, we know one person who's also an inspiration to children, and that's the author himself, Dr. Jeffrey Bennett. A Colorado-based astrophysicist and former NASA scientist, Jeff has also been a CU professor, and he once taught in elementary and middle school. He's also the author of several textbooks about mathematics, statistics, and of course, astronomy. But in 2003, he made his debut as a children's book author with Max Goes to the Moon. Since then, Jeff has written sequels to Max, including Max Goes to Mars and Max Goes to Jupiter. And yes, you may have guessed it. The inspiration for this series is Dr. Bennett's own dog, Max. He's a 120-pound Rottweiler, best known for making playground merry-go-rounds spin. Quite the playful dog, Max is also great with children. I spoke earlier with Dr. Bennett and asked him why he decided to start writing children's books really goes back to when I was teaching at the elementary school level, which I did while I was an undergraduate, took a year off and spent time in a second and third grade classroom and I ran my own summer school for a few years doing science and math for elementary school kids. And I just, at the time, thought there was a need for some books that might do a little better job presenting science to kids in a fun and interesting way. Fun. So um, I, now, you want to put in real scientific facts also along with a fun story. Obviously, you know, a dog might not always go to the moon, but you put that in with a sidebar. So how important is that to mix real science, I guess, in with fun, entertaining stories? Well, for me, that's the whole point of it. My real goal is to teach the science with these books. Mm -hmm. And the story is a vehicle for getting the kids interested in it. I think if you look back at the kinds of other books that are available for kids in science, probably my biggest complaint about them, aside from the fact that they often have uh, scientific errors, but it, besides that, my biggest complaint is that they tend to just be like many encyclopedias. It's, you know, my book of the stars and this fact and that fact and so on. There's no story, there's no plot, there's nothing to carry you along. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to try to come up with a story that would carry the kids along but have enough science in there that they're really learning something new. And maybe the little secret of the books there is that I actually write them backwards. I first oh. start with what science concepts do I want to teach in my 32 pages that I have available, and then I write a story to fit those concepts. So you don't write them backwards like Leonardo da Vinci? and <laughs> Not, <laughs> Not like quite that, that way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can read them without a mirror. Gotcha. All right, so then um, by keeping it fun, why did you choose a dog as your protagonist? Well, you know, there's an interesting story back there. I had the idea of wanting to write these books a long, long time ago, and it took, a, from the time I had that idea, it was about 20 years <laughs> until I finally came up with, okay, what could the story be that would go with that? And I was actually out with my son as a baby, walking along with our dog, pushing him in the stroller, and we looked up at the sky, and there was the moon, and it just, I don't know, one of those moments of inspiration, it popped into my head, hey, I should write a story about taking our dog to the moon. Oh, well, that's really that's so sweet. So now, now Tori in the book is she is she based off a, a daughter or as anyone? Or is that just a generic child or why? You know, I decided that I wanted to put a girl in the story as the main character, and that also goes back to the time when I taught elementary school, because one of the things that you deal with in space is that it's better today, but 
if you go back a couple of decades, and even to some extent still today, people talk about the manned space program and men going to the moon and things like that. First and step I remember, for mankind. <laughs> right. And I remember one little girl in particular in second grade, when I, she told me how much she loves space and so on. I said, do you want to be an astronaut? Or a, and she said, well, I can't be because that's only for men. Oh. And I thought, well, that's a terrible message to have. So I thought if I put a girl in as the main character, that would be one way of broadening the horizon for uh, who might be interested in the story and be thinking about becoming a scientist, space scientist, an astronaut. Definitely. Now, was her name Tori? Um, her name was not Tori. Tori, <laughs> <laughs> when my son was born, my wife and I decided not to find out the sex in advance. Oh, okay. So we had two names picked. So my son's name is Grant, and he would have been Tori had he been a girl. <laughs> I'm glad so he, he, I'm So he's... Tori still lives as a result of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he's glad that you named him Grant, not Tori. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> All right. So um, now in your dedication, you dedicate it to the children around the world, and you tell them to follow your dreams, study hard, and someday you'll live in a world as wonderful as the one we imagine in this book. So with this, how do you plan to inspire children to really get into science? Well, whenever I'm working on these books, I always have three main goals in mind. I think of them as education, perspective, and inspiration. So I want to get some real science, real education across. I want them to think about what learning about these things in science, particularly in astronomy, means to us as human beings and how it might affect our own lives if we understand what else is out there. And then inspiration, I want them to be inspired to want to live in a better world and then to do their part to make this world a better place. And you called out in the um, dedication, I have the word study hard in there. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly important to me. You know, I like to get on my soapbox about science education or mm -hmm. education in general. And I think one of the most difficult challenges for kids today is that we live in this world where things seem to come instantaneously. You want to know something, you look it up on Google, boom, boom, boom. But the fact is, if you really want to learn something, you actually have to sit down, study, and have some intense concentration time. It's no different today than ever because our brains are no different today <laughs> than ever. And so I think I want to make sure that message gets out that it's great to have all these dreams of what you want to do. Now actually go do the work it takes to get to them. Definitely. Now, do you think that there should be more work put into the science programs? Do you think they should be, uh, the current programs in the public schools, do you think that sh they should be improved or focus more on science? Or what do you think about that? Well, certainly, I, I don't think there's any question they need to be improved when you look at the statistics that we get in this country on mm -hmm. math and science education. They're quite poor compared to other countries. I think you can make a pretty strong case that the reason our economy is falling apart right now is because we're so bad at math as a nation. You know, we've ignored these realities that there's nothing new about these debt crises, deficit crises. There's nothing new about the space shuttle being 30 years old, right? We've known all this was coming, but all of a sudden we're in crisis mode. No more shuttle hitting the debt ceiling, not knowing what to do, when if we had just been thinking about what the implications down the line would be we could have dealt with these, thing, with these things decades ago. So I'm hoping that if we can put a more emphasis on science and math education, get kids more educated, we can prevent these kinds of problems in the future and solve the problems we already have. Gear touchdown. The nose of the shuttle being rotated down toward the flight deck. The parachute being deployed. And nose gear touchdown and the end of a historic journey. And to the ship that has led the way time and time again, we say farewell, Discovery. At the end of the Space Shuttle Discovery's final mission, Jeffrey Bennett was presented with a certificate conferring Max as an honorary member of the crew. Although fictional, Max Goes to the Moon is our first trip back to lunar soil since the Apollo missions ended in the early 1970s. But today, the moon appears to be back on our radar. Leading the way is NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Its mission? To scout for safe and compelling landing sites, locate potential resources, and return data that will help us understand the moon's topography and composition. 
So far, the LRO has forever changed the way we look at the moon, delivering sharper and more detailed images and maps than we've ever seen before. Then there's NASA's Twin Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory spacecraft, also known as GRAIL. Now in lunar orbit, the GRAIL-A and GRAIL-B will work together to map out the moon's gravitational field, allowing scientists to understand what's happening beneath the lunar surface. Finally, NASA's Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer is set to launch in 2013. And it will carry a high-tech lunar dust detector designed and built at CU Boulder's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. Known as the Lunar Dust Experiment, the instrument will assess the nature of dust lofted high above the moon's surface. <laughs> yes, Ringo, that's good news for CU, doing our part to help future manned missions to the moon. Well, that's it for this edition of CU Science Update. We hope you enjoyed this edition. Look for us again as soon as we bring you more news about science at CU and beyond. So Ringo, now are you ready for some playtime? <laughs> CU Science Update is produced by University of Colorado at Boulder, Journalism and Mass Communication. To download this episode and others from CU Science Update, visit the podcast section of the iTunes Store. Or you can visit our website at cuscienceupdate.com. Finally, don't forget to like us on our Facebook page, where we post the latest in science happening in Boulder and beyond. <laughs>